The Mongols were once an empire of tremendous power. It was a large empire that ruled over nearly 30% of the Earth's surface area, including Myanmar, North Korea, and Turkey. Almost the entire Eurasian continent was the territory of the Mongol Empire. The foundation of its strength was created by Genghis Khan, the grandfather of Hubilai Khan. To avoid missing out on various information about Japan, click the subscribe button and leave a comment saying, I subscribed. The secret of the Mongol Empire's strength lay in its strategy. The countries that became territories and the property of those countries were divided equally among the families. The Mongol Empire would be economically enriched by the amount of countries that became its territories. In addition, the Mongolian Empire made the people of the lands it occupied work hard. Those who worked were paid for their work. Some of the countries that became territories paid tribute without fighting and joined the Mongol Empire. Thus, the Mongol Empire grew while increasing its wealth and people. Later, Hubilai Khan changed the country's name from the Mongol Empire to Yuan, or Great Yuan. In 1266, a letter arrived from Yuan former Mongol Empire. The Mongolian history books contain the contents of the letter. The letter reads as follows. The Great Mongolian State, National Letter. This letter is sent to the King of Japan from the Emperor of the Great Mongolian State, which is protected by the heavens. Since ancient times, neighboring countries bordering each other, even if they are small, have endeavored to get along with each other through trade and people-to-people -people exchanges. The emperors of the Great Mongol Empire ruled large territories by order of the heavens, and countries far away have been fearful and grateful to the emperors of the Mongols for generations, and have become their retainers. For example, after I became emperor, Koryo Korea surrendered to Mongol and became a vassal state. And I and the king of Koryo became like father and son, which was a joyous occasion. Koryo is my territory to the east. But how is it that Japan, though friendly with Koryo and trading with China from time immemorial, has not sent a single letter to the great Mongol emperor, nor has she sought to establish diplomatic relations with him? If Japan does not know about us, it is a matter of concern, so I will send a special messenger to convey my feelings through this letter. From now on, Japan and the Great Mongolian Empire will be on good terms with each other in a state-to-state -state intercourse. We consider all nations as one house, and Japan should also consider us as her father. If they do not understand this, they will send their armies, which we do not like. I hope the King of Japan will consider this sentiment carefully and reply. Fusen. The person who sent the letter to Japan was, Kublai Khan, the fifth emperor of the Mongolian Empire. This was just as the Mongolian Empire was beginning to take full swing under the regime of Kublai Khan, and the country's name was changed to Yuan, in Goryeo. A resistance organization called Sanbetsho was formed and the Mongols were not able to suppress it easily. Furthermore, the Southern Song Dynasty Southern China was engaged in a major war against the Mongols. Under these circumstances, the Mongols needed Japan to become a vassal state in order to control the Southern Song. At first glance, the letter appears to be a proposal for diplomatic relations. But it is not on an equal footing, and the last part of the letter includes the words, Do as I say or I will send my troops. However, Japan ignored Yuan's numerous state letters at every turn. Japan tried to prevent the Mongol invasion with its whole country, but since it had no experience in fighting foreign enemies, it did not yet understand the horror of such an invasion. At this time, the Sogonate tried to overcome this national crisis by appointing Hojo Tokumune, who was only 18 years old, as regent. The Mongolian envoys were Koryo people people from the country located in Joseon, so the envoys were caught between Japan and Mongolia. 
After that, Yuan Mongol ordered Koryo to dispatch envoys to Japan several times. However, since the Koryo had to bear the cost of soldiers and food in the event of war with Japan, they returned on the way home. Citing bad weather and other reasons, or encouraged Japan to establish diplomatic relations with the Mongols. In January 1274 Fuburai ordered the Koryo dynasty to build ships for an expedition to Japan. The Koryo was to provide 35,000 laborers, food, and lumber for the expedition. The Koryo had to provide 35,000 laborers, food, and timber for the shipbuilding, and the cost was very high. In just 10 months, 300 large ships, 300 medium-sized ships, and 300 small ships for water supply were built. It was a huge task to build a total of 900 boats in just 10 months. Because Goryeo had to build so many ships at once, the ships were not built in the sturdy Chinese style, but in the simpler Goryeo style. It is said that this was a disaster later on. The Mongol Empire's style of warfare was distinct, marked by superior strategy, horse-mounted archery, and a highly disciplined army. In 1268, Kublai Khan sent envoys to the Kamakura Bakufu, the ruling government of Japan, demanding their submission. The Bakufu, however, dismissed this demand outright, inciting the Mongols to initiate the first invasion in 1274. The Mongol army, composed of Mongol, Chinese, and Korean forces, crossed the Tsushima Strait and landed on the shores of Hakata Bay in Kyushu. The Japanese samurai were formidable warriors, but they were unaccustomed to the Mongols' way of warfare. This unpreparedness initially led to heavy losses among the samurai. The Mongols began their invasion ferociously, but they strangely retreated to their ships by nightfall, likely due to the receding tide. That night, a powerful typhoon ripped through the region, severely damaging the Mongol fleet and forcing them to abort their invasion. The Japanese credited this serendipitous storm, which staved off a probable defeat, to a divine wind, or, kamikaze. Kami is Japanese for God, and Keis is Japanese for wind. In 1281, a second invasion was launched by Kublai Khan. This time, the Mongol force was even larger and was split into two separate fleets, intending to attack from Korea and China simultaneously. The Japanese, having learned from their prior encounter, erected a defensive wall known as the Genko Borui, along Hakata Bay. Despite the Mongols' superior numbers and advanced weapons, the Japanese managed to put up a sturdy defense for several weeks. In a dramatic turn of events, a second divine wind, or kamikaze, swept through the region, devastating the Mongol fleet. A significant part of the Mongol force was destroyed in the typhoon, compelling the surviving invaders to retreat. Post these invasions, the Mongol Empire never threatened Japan again. The samurai who defended their homeland were celebrated as national heroes, and the concept of the kamikaze. The Divine Wind, acquired a legendary status in Japanese culture, symbolizing Japan's divine protection. The Genko period and the Kamikaze are more than just accounts of military campaigns and natural disasters. They epitomize the unyielding spirit of the Japanese people, their courage in confronting overwhelming odds, and their enduring belief in divine assistance. Moreover, these events significantly influenced Japan's unique martial tradition and shaped its attitudes towards foreign invasion leaving a profound impact on Japan's cultural identity. The invasions occurred in 1274 and 1281, and conventional historical accounts have often attributed the failure of these invasions to the kamikaze, or, divine wind. Powerful typhoons that purportedly destroyed the Mongol fleets. However, some historians propose an alternative narrative, suggesting that the Mongol invasions may not have been the categorical failures that popular history often portrays them to be.
they argue that the Mongols, known for their military prowess, may have indeed scored a partial victory against the Japanese forces. In the first invasion of 1274, the Mongols landed on the beaches of Hakata Bay with a massive force, combining Mongol, Chinese, and Korean soldiers. The samurai warriors of Japan were not used to the Mongols' style of warfare, which was characterized by highly coordinated infantry attacks and effective use of archery from horseback. The first day of fighting was particularly harsh for the Japanese. As night fell, the Mongols retreated to their ships, a move often attributed to the tide. That night, a great storm supposedly decimated the Mongol fleet, and they were forced to retreat. While the storm did occur, some historians suggest it wasn't as catastrophic to the Mongols as traditional narratives portray. Instead, they argue that the Mongols, having tested the Japanese defenses and found them wanting, may have retreated with the intent to return with a larger, better prepared force. The second invasion in 1281 saw an even larger Mongol force. While the Japanese had prepared by building defensive walls, the Mongols managed to breach them at several points. The invasion turned into a long, drawn-out engagement, characterized by sporadic land battles and a naval blockade. Then, supposedly, another kamikaze, or divine wind occurred, destroying the Mongol fleet. Recent archaeological and historical research has questioned the extent and effect of this second divine wind. While a typhoon did indeed strike, some argue that it came. After a significant portion of the Mongol forces had already been defeated by the Japanese or succumbed to disease and supply shortages. The concept of kamikaze has a powerful place in Japanese national mythology, symbolizing divine intervention to protect the islands. However, it is important to question and scrutinize such narratives, as the historical reality may have been more complex. It's also worth noting the consequences of these invasions. Despite the heavy losses, the Mongol Empire did not fall and continued to be a significant force. On the other hand, Japan's military government, the Kamakura Bakufu, was seriously strained by the defense efforts and eventually collapsed in 1333. Partly due to the aftermath of the invasions. This suggests that, while the Mongols did not achieve outright conquest, their invasions profoundly impacted Japanese society and governance. In summary, while the story of the kamikaze and a decisive Japanese victory is widely accepted, it's worth considering that historical events like the Mongol invasions of Japan were complex and multifaceted. The narrative that Japan was once defeated by the Mongol Empire, and the idea that the kamikaze may not have played a crucial role, is a compelling alternative perspective. That adds depth and nuance to our understanding of this significant period in world history. Thanks for watching this video. Please click the high rating button and let me know what you think of this video as well. See you next one.